Good morning, Southside Bible Church. I'd like to welcome any visitors who be with us this morning. We're grateful that you would come worship our God together, and we hope that you feel very welcomed and loved in this body of Christ. A couple announcements I wanted to follow up on what Joel shared. If, uh, this newcomer's class, if you have been coming for a little while or this is your first Sunday, it's a class that is going to save you 10 years of trying to figure out how do we run things, what is our theology. Uh, we we want to just give you the, the crash course. So if you could come be a part of that, we'd love to have you uh, starting up soon. And then the Entrench uh, for the ladies locking in to study the Word of God. It's called The Author of Our Story. And just to come and, and learn, we all have our, our goals and thoughts of how we want our life to go. And how do we follow the sovereign God and His authorship of our lives and our story and to submit to this beautiful God who's working to conform us to Christ. So I've read over all that will be taught. Uh, it's fantastic. So I, I already have been edified and encouraged. So I just want to make sure if you have not signed up, there's something up there on the screen right now. Um, it's a QR code. So that's growth for your pastor. Um, I don't know how to use one yet, but I like them. So I'm told if you put your phone or something on it and it, it will register you. So uh, if you have not registered, there's going to be a place outside afterwards, and you can just use that QR code right now. If you need any help, I'd be happy to, after the service with the QR code. So This morning is a very special Lord's Day. Every day is special on the Lord's Day, but today we partake of the Lord's table together at the close of our service. We're going to have communion Together And this, this really heightens the awareness of our unity, uh, what our hope and our faith is in together. And it also brings us back and reminds us of our first love, uh, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that we could be redeemed. And so it's a time to remember that, that Greek word is to take a past event and to bring it into the present where it affects you today and, and to come and remember what Christ Jesus has done for us. What a beautiful thing that Jesus has left for us this morning. So at the close of our service, uh, we will partake of that together. We're studying through the letter of uh, Philippi that Paul wrote to the Philippians here. So if you'll turn to Philippians, this morning we're starting up a new chapter, chapter 3. So turn there now. And I have found that these verses are going to work very well to help us remember Jesus Christ at the table. So we'll stay in our study Uh, in Philippians. So Philippians 3, 1 through 3, let me read that. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, and beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God in glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Son, Holy Spirit, add the blessing now to these words. Holy Spirit, illuminate our minds as we open them up. Let us comprehend the truth of the revelation of God that we hold in our hands an inerrant word that has been given to us by you, God. So um, open our minds to understand it, and I pray that our hearts would be taken up with these truths and our wills would be determined to follow after King Jesus. And so, Lord, would you uh, meet us now in our time of worship in the Word of God. I pray that you would be glorified and the aroma of Jesus Christ would fill this room as we bow in prayer at the close of this sermon. God, thank you for these words. Bless them now to the people of God. Amen. Oh, while we treasure the whole counsel of God, because it all has been inspired, God breathed by him, and it's useful for correction and rebuke, training and righteousness, so that the man of God would be adequate and, and complete. So there are certain parts to it that have been used mightily um, by God over the history of the church. And when we were in Romans, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God for salvation. And then when we turn to Romans 3.21, one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, the but now, and what God has done to remedy 
the fallenness and the brokenness of humanity since Adam and Eve. And then Romans 8, we almost spent a year on the eternal security that we have in Christ. And one of these other chapters that are just so rich is Philippians chapter 3. And so I'm just praying that the Lord would meet us in a powerful and transforming way as we come and labor together in this chapter. And so um, Paul has been talking about this gospel for two chapters And we've been learning that we have a koinonia, this sharing uh, together in the gospel. And there's a need to have unity in the gospel to advance and spread it and to show the world that, that you can get unity with all different walks of life and different beliefs when we come together in Christ. What a unity. And then he said, in our humility and in our love, it's the atmosphere that the gospel spreads best. And then he talked about our sacrificial service And self-denial is at the heart of seeing faith ignited and built up in one another. But now we're going to move into chapter 3, and Paul's just going to laser in on what is this gospel. We've heard what it does, our, our sharing in it, our oneness in it, but what is it that we are to unify on and believe, defend, proclaim, and really to give our lives for? It better be rich and beautiful to surrender everything to it. Luther said, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. That's what we're going to be looking at as a gospel worthy of that. I've been a Christian for some 35 years, and this gospel has not run dry for me. It's sweeter and clearer than it's ever been, and it is worthy to lose your life for. And Paul's going to lay that glorious gospel now out before us in chapter three, so I'm gonna ask you to pull up and come stare into the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ. And what I love about it is Romans three, it was very doctrinal to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now Philippians three, though, is more personal testimony. It's more how did it affect me personally? Paul's gonna share and and open that up what it did in his heart. And so I'm asking that we listen to Paul's testimony of what the gospel did to him. And the application is very clear. Has it done that in my heart? So I want you to be examining your own heart. Has the Holy Spirit brought you to this place? And it will be a focusing of the camera, making clear what the gospel means to us. Because I believe that you can talk about the gospel every week and not be transformed by it. And so my prayer is that we're transformed by what we're going to be looking at. I want that to change in every one of our lives during this time and let it begin with me. So let's take it up and may God bless us richly in his word in this season. Let me give you a bird's eye view as we jump in once again. Chapter one, I'm just going to give you our outline as we journeyed. Paul said you need to put the fellowship of the gospel at the center of our relations with one another. That's what binds us together. That's what we koinonia over. Then he said you need to put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your prayer life. And what we're praying for is that the gospel would advance in, in us and in others. Then he said put the advance of the gospel at the center of your aspirations. Uh, whether people are preaching the gospel out of pretense or truth, just care that he's proclaimed. Just want the gospel preached. And then fourthly, he said, put the converts of the gospel at the center of your principled self-denial. Paul wanted to go home. To die is very much better, but I'm going to remain on for the building up of your joy and faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he transitioned to call you to live worthy of such a gospel. One spirit, one mind striving for it with joy, suffering for his name's sake. And he said, the key is you got to be humble and not self-glorying. It can no longer be about your glory. It's got to be about the glory of Christ. And then he gave us these beautiful examples that that's how Jesus was. He left glory. He didn't look for his own privileges and he emptied himself and he went to the point of dying on a cross. We looked at Paul, who's this drink offering being poured out for others' faith. We looked at Timothy. There's no one else who will have a genuine concern for you but Timothy. And we looked at Epaphroditus who risked his life and just loved and all the sacrifice that we saw going between the church, Epaphroditus, and Paul. 
And so we are to serve, he said, without grumbling and disputing and we'll be bright lights. And now Paul takes up his pen and he says, why, why such a preoccupation with the gospel? What is it? Why is it so precious? Why are the scriptures better than our necessary food? Because no food will ever do for you what Philippians 3 is going to do for you in the weeks and months ahead. So come feast upon Christ. If I had to say, what is chapter 3 about? It is about the, the glory and beauty of Christ being better than everything. I count everything else as loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So I like how Paul sets the tone for this chapter This is not to beat us up and make us miserable. The very first verse, it's a call to joy. Enter into my joy. This is the most joyful life and thing you could ever have. It's not come be miserable and a lemon-sucking Christian with me. Come find joy. The most unjoyful life is to know the gospel and live like it doesn't matter. If that's how you're living, I, I don't even have to know you. You're miserable. And today, Paul's saying, come, enter into the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's take it up. A call to joy in Philippians 3.1. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little fired up today. <laughs> Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Finally means furthermore, so then, transition. This is a call to rejoice, and it's a call to rejoice in Christ. That'll be the flow of this chapter. And so to set the, the context, we've already seen that false teachers are trying to get you to stray away from Christ. And I think what Paul is doing is absolutely brilliant by the Holy Spirit. If you are rejoicing in Christ, if you are treasuring Him, trusting Him, communing with Him, I want you to hear this. You're most likely not going to be led astray to something else. You want to protect against false teachers? You can be brilliant. I've seen it. You got so much theology and you still get led astray. And Paul's going to get to, when you're treasuring Jesus Christ, all these lies and false teachings, they're not going to barb you and draw you in. Temptation loses its power when thou art near, says the hymn writer. And so I'm so joyful in the perfect work of Jesus Christ and his nearness that I can't turn to something lesser like circumcision to get right with God, a, a deeper life. You can only eat these kinds of foods. You gotta join our church to be a real Christian. You need to be baptized by our denomination or you're not a real believer. Those are feathers, they're weightless if you are treasuring Jesus Christ. Throw those things at me and I'm like Superman, they bounce right off. You just, they're not gonna barb you, they're not gonna draw you in. I won't turn away from the one who I'm found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Keep your joy in Christ. And Paul says that's a safeguard from all these false teachings. You know who gets tricked by false teachers? <clears throat> Those who are not rejoicing, not content, wanting sin, grumblers, and disputers who love a good fight. Give me something new because the old paths are boring and you'll bite every false teaching as it comes around. You will not quickly desert the one who you're rejoicing in. And I'll tell you this, if you're sad or depressed in the Lord, you will always be susceptible to false teaching. And I've watched many that have been drawn away by false teaching in my journey. And it's always the empty ones that get drawn into it. The ones who are full in Christ spit that stuff out like bones. So this is crucial. Rejoice in the Lord. How? Do you watch Fox News? Do you see what's happening to our country? The amount of trials this church is facing? How? Pastor, that feels Pollyanna to me. And the key, don't miss the phrase, in the Lord. 
the one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, the one that I can find joy in by who he is and what he's done, and he will not change, and my, my position will not change. I have something to rejoice in that's beautiful and glorious that doesn't change like my circumstances do. So you'll never, if you rejoice in your circumstances, you're going to just be like this your whole life. And the Christians who start growing and maturing, when they begin to realize, I rejoice in the Lord, uh, they're, they're untouchable. And they become steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. This is, Paul's bringing us into something really, really sweet. Our rejoicing is connected to a relationship. It's a sphere in which our joy is found. Happiness is associated with events and things, not a relationship. And so the joy that Paul is calling for here, it's about a relationship with Christ. And as you experience the Lord himself, as, as one preacher said, as your satisfying treasure, you will rejoice in everything that comes from the Lord. And you'll say in Philippians 3.10, I want to know him, and I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings, because they're going to come together. And I'm going to find that in these sufferings, I, I know him deeper. And in knowing him, I suffer better. And these things are going to be really married and really joined together. And this does not mean that everything that happens to you is joyful, but it's an exhilaration from a relationship with Jesus Christ. This relationship puts a melody in the heart, no matter how bad and decaying this world is or my own body. There's this hymn that was cheesy, but I liked it. Jesus keeps me singing as I go. When God takes your health and your relationships and your possessions, a good test. Where am I finding joy? And this is the only cure for grumbling, is to find this in Christ and to fill it with rejoicing. And the one who will do this or the church that will do this will be shining stars in a world of corruption and despair and grumbling. As to what joy is, I'm going to save that for chapter four because he's going to park on it. So we're going to dig in deeper into what it is, but for this morning, what I want you to know, it's the key to this chapter, and it's the key to not being carried away by false teaching. And so just one quote that captures this joy before I move on, F.B. Meyer, he's a commentator who said, the joy of the Lord arises from leaving all of our burdens at his feet, from believing that he has forgiven the past as absolutely as the tide obliterates children's writing in the sand, that nothing can come which he does not appoint or permit, but he is doing all things as wisely and as kindly as possible, that in him we have been lifted out of the realm of sin, sorrow, and death into a realm of divine light and love, that we have already commenced the eternal life, and that before us forever there is fellowship with him so rapturous and exalting that human language can only describe it as unspeakable. The joy is easy to lose and drift from in the Lord. It has been my hardest battle since I've been a Christian to not make my joy in my circumstances but in the Lord. And, and when we fall into depression, I'll, I'll never forget. The psalmist said, why so downcast all of my soul? Put your hope in God. Hope in the Lord. Lift your, your head, lift your eyes, look back to your hope that you have in Christ. Paul is going to show us that joy can be sustained in the Lord by the Holy Spirit. Tim Keller, when he was alive, said, Our identity in Christ gives us our righteousness that God requires, and that'll be the rest of this chapter that the, the righteousness that God requires, he gives to us by faith. And he says, in this, we gain an unshakable stability. The one who really gets that, there's an unshakable stability to your life. I pray that we could lay hold of what that means. We're going to journey that uh, for a few weeks. But let's dig in this morning. I want to give you a simple outline First, Paul's going to show us hindrances to joy, and then he's going to give us helps to joy. 
So verse two are the hindrances to our joy and verse three are the helps to joy. And I wanna pray one more time. Father, I pray that you would set us free from being slaves to our circumstances defining our joy. God, by your spirit this morning, would you allow us to see that we have a righteousness, not our own, given to us by grace through faith, and we stand in your presence blameless with great joy, and the reward for this is going to be abundant and amazing. And so I pray, God, make us unshakable with stability. God, I pray, grow our joy this morning. If anyone is in these hindrances, set them free, and let us all go deeper into the helps for our joy. Make us a glad, happy people in Christ, I pray. Amen. So Paul says in verse 1, to write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Safeguard is a verb, and it meant to trip, to cause to fall, or to overthrow. And he he puts it um, negated. So I'm writing these things so you won't trip, so you won't fall, so you won't be overthrown with what's going to be thrown at you and what's going to come upon you. And I'll repeat myself again and again. Paul says this is foundational, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the only way to to be in the Father's presence uh, blameless with great joy. So I, I don't get weary of this message, Paul says, nor should we. This is for your eternal security and for your help and your joy. I'll never weary of holding up Christ as Savior. It's no problem, Paul says. I'll write it again and again. I need thee every hour. Isn't this the heart of ministry? Sunday school teachers, I pray, do not get weary of holding up that diamond called Jesus Christ and let those kids look at it every day from a different angle. Parents, Never grow weary of preaching Jesus Christ to your kids. I was a broken record. It was just stuck on Jesus, Jesus. You know what a record is, guys? (laughs) These little things you put on and they'd go around and if, if it got stuck in a groove, it just kept repeating the same verse. Jesus, Jesus, tell them from every angle again and again. uh, Southside Academy, praise God, it starts up this week. All those little kids, teachers, let them hear about Jesus from every angle. Uh, I don't know if they're here or not. Uh, Joyful Light, I get to teach the junior high the attributes of God, and I come in here and I'm shocked how many kids, 100, 20, 50, I don't know, they're just everywhere. And, And they're coming in, and what a message to keep bringing the gospel to all these kids again and again, pray for that beautiful ministry. Teachers, counselors, disciples, evangelists, never grow weary of the message of Christ crucified. I think I've sat with 500 people, drawn this little diagram that God showed me over all the years of, of, of the gospel that clicks for me. And, and I, every time I drive away, I, I, I go away going, I just glory in this gospel. I never get tired of preaching it, sharing it, and just watching the power of it. It's no trouble to write it again or say it again or remind you again. Never grow weary of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter said, therefore, I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present with you. You know it and you're established in it, and I'm never going to get tired of telling you about it week in and week out. I just got one string on my banjo and I pray it never breaks. It's Jesus Christ. (laughs) So let's look at this as a safeguard against hindrances to joy. These are the ropes that tie up the believer and give you burdens and yokes. I've been counseling this forever in my own life and in yours. It's called legalism. And legalism is going to steal your joy quicker than anything you will ever find. Don't go back under a yoke of slavery, Paul wrote to the Galatians. You you, you can't literally go back under the law once you're a Christian, but you certainly can come back under in your mind and put yourself back under that yoke. Do not go back under it. So hindrances to joy. Are you ready? Verse two, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, and beware of the false circumcision. And so I want to just give you a little background as we begin. 
<laughs> the commentators, everyone I read, seem to be agreed that this is dealing with professing Christian Jews. <clears throat> and this is dealing with a confusion that goes all the way back to Father Abraham, who had many sons. And there are many Jews that believe that we're children of God because we are in a covenant relationship through Abraham. We've been brought in through a mark called circumcision. And if you get circumcision, you belong to God. You're saved. You're right with him. You want to get right with God? Circumcision. The Talmud said the command of circumcision is more important than all the other injunctions of Scripture. And so the most important thing to be a child of God, they thought, was to be circumcised. And that comes from Genesis 17. I'll read it to you. This is my covenant, God says, which you shall keep between me and you, Abraham, and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who's eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or who's brought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendants. <clears throat> and as the Bible unfolds, we find that this is typological. It's pointing to something bigger. It's pointing to that what's going to happen in the new covenant is I'm going to circumcise your heart. The way you belong to the people of God now is God will circumcise this heart and everyone in the new covenant will be believers. And everyone in the old covenant that got circumcised, most of them were unbelievers as we watched it go. So the new covenant is all will know me and I'll circumcise that heart that is of flesh. Deuteronomy 10, 16, this is throughout the Old Testament. Circumcise then your heart and stiffen your neck no more. Deuteronomy 36, moreover the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul in order that you may live. He'll circumcise your heart and it will love God from the inside to the out. And the Jews missed this. They were religious to the T in all of their external service. They tried to keep that law. They did everything that they could that Moses commanded, but their heart was wicked. And Christ said, out of the heart flows the springs of life. They couldn't change their heart. They could only do the externals. And they would circumcise their children on the eighth day religiously, and they missed what the whole thing was pointing to. In Romans 2.25, Paul writes, For indeed, circumcision is of value <coughs> if you practice the law. But if you're a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. If therefore the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Because it shows his heart. And will not he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law... Will he not judge you who, though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of it? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a true Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but it will come now from God." What a climax in redemptive history this is. And so the outward means something if it represents the inside. We did baptisms last week. And, and if there's nothing on the heart, all you did was get wet. But if the heart has been changed, it was a picture that God took you from what you were in Adam and you died and you've been raised to walk in newness of life. So for Israel, circumcision was not just a tribal tattoo. The misunderstanding of it and the law and the covenant brought Paul much controversy and difficulty. So Paul comes preaching now this message of grace, and the Jews were opposed to it. Their heritage, their life, their existence, all they knew, there was such an offense to what he was preaching. And they would say to get saved or to stay saved, you've got to keep all the ceremonial laws and you need to get circumcised. And they would show the Old Testament scriptures and they were just confusing people and causing all kinds of troubles for Paul wherever he planted churches. So Paul wrote a whole book on this problem called Galatians. In Acts 15.1, this debate broke out in the church. And some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren and said, unless you are circumcised, According to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
In Acts 15, 10, <clears throat> now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have ever been able to bear? No one can keep the law. But, but what we believe that we're saved through grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. So the Gentiles get saved the same way. We don't put the yoke of the law back on them and say, here, you got to keep this to be saved. You've missed the whole gospel. And so their message was that you needed more than Christ alone to be a child of God. You needed more to get justified. And Paul's going to show us that Christ plus something, it, it doesn't just um, cause a little bit of misunderstanding. It takes the heart out of the gospel and its heresy. And, and Paul says, let them be anathema. Let anyone that takes Christ alone out of this message of justification, let them be consigned to hell. That gentle man vigorously and aggressively opposed any who would add anything to that gospel that would, that would give life to what he proclaimed and believed. And he's going to look at him and he's going to say, you're dogs. You're dogs. And I look at the spirit of the age and we just accept anyone that says, oh, I'm loved by God. Even if they add something to Christ, like you got to get baptized to be saved. You got to do this ordinance this way to be saved. I'm telling you, this is all around us and Paul would not accept what is going on today in many churches. And he would stand up and say, let him be anathema. Luther would roll over in his grave. I want you to pay close attention to how Paul is going to address this issue this morning. Keep in mind, they were not, they, they were not denying Christ. They were saying we believe in him. Christ plus. They were saying they believed but you just got to be circumcised along with Jesus. You got to keep these days to be a Christian. And so I ask you, is this a small thing to add? And let's, let's get Paul's answer. Beware of the dogs. It's in the imperative. It's a command. Um, we're to be on the lookout. And he says it three times in this verse. Beware, beware, beware. Wake up. We must be on the lookout for this kind of heresy at all times. The devil wants to sow this into his church because it starves and kills your joy. Our flesh loves this stuff. Every one of us want to bring something to the table. Jesus plus my work, my effort, my doing this. We just always Jesus plus something. And Paul says you add one thread of your righteousness to the garment of Jesus Christ and you've just polluted it. You are now damned and condemned. You can't stand before God with your flesh in the garment of righteousness. It might not come in the dress of circumcision. I don't hear that a lot today, but it will come in a moral dress. Like you can't dip, chew, or go with girls who do. Uh, you need to serve this much for God to be pleased with you. You got to belong to this church or this denomination or you're not really saved. You need to partake of communion in this way. You need to read your Bible. If you don't have King James Version only, you're not a Christian. You need this much of a changed life before you can rest in Jesus Christ. All of these things are going to be added and they're going to be brought in. And please think, is there anything other than the work of Christ this morning that you're holding to for your acceptance with God. And this needs some time alone with God and you. Is there anything that you have added to this work for acceptance with Christ? Would you repent before God right now if something has subtly crept in that has stolen your joy because you've added Christ plus? Yes. What does Paul call these teachers? Dogs. Sometimes that doesn't grab us the way it should, because when you think of dogs, what do you think? Give me poochie. Right? That, that doesn't click anymore. Um, I've had people say, you know what? I'm done with humans. I just need my dog. And I'm like, I get that. I understand what you're saying. But this statement does not carry the weight the way Paul meant it. 
And this is the kind of dog in Paul's days, they, were, they weren't trained pets, they were scroungy scavengers. They ate garbage, they, they licked wounds, they, they were disgusting. They would attack people, unclean, mangy mutts. They were a scurvy dog. And maybe it'd be better to say, you rats, you cockroaches, you venomous snakes, but it's dogs, you dogs. Revelation twenty two fifteen. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves practicing lying. Here's the pointedness of this statement. Why did the Jews call the Gentiles dogs? They called them dogs saying, you're unclean, you're filthy, you're outside the people of God. And, and it's startling now that Paul flips it, he says, you're the dogs. You're the dogs. This is not how you win friends and influence people. Um, Thems are fighting words. (laughs) Stay away from these snarling, false teachers. They have all their religious and moral robes, but they're mangy mutts. They appear as angels of lights. They're the good guys at our love feasts. And it's always out of love as they steal your joy and damn your souls. I pray that you would beware of the dogs. Get some fight in you to not drink that stuff up like Kool-Aid. Beware of the evil workers. It's amazing. These Jews think they're pleasing God by their works. This is how you please God, by keeping the law. Paul used to be the foremost we'll see next week. They, they think they've earned God's favor by what they're doing, by their beads, their candles, they genuflect, their attendance. They're, they're doing everything right. And, 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 and today's modern day is, I've done everything that God wanted. Why is he doing this to my life? He owes me. And we're just doing all the same things that the Judaizers were doing. We've done all these good things you owe me. And Paul says, you're evil workers. Maybe you're here and you still trust and your good works, and not Christ alone. And that's what we're going to be going after, I pray. Repent from... Most people know to repent from their sins. And the call of the church today is you have to repent of your righteousness. You can't be saved without repenting of your righteousness until you realize it's a filthy rag. And anything I bring is not going to be pleasing to God if I add it to Christ. I just want you today, sitting before God, to repent of anything that you're holding up as something that's going to get you accepted. Please be set free and find joy in Christ alone for righteousness this morning. There is not a better message than that. Beware of the false circumcision. The word for circumcision is paratame, and it meant to cut around. And Paul chooses a different word, katatome, and it meant to cut up. You're the mutilation. Without the heart, it's nothing. Circumcision is just mutilating. It's not doing anything for you, Jews. Galatians 5, uh, 12, Paul said, would that those who are troubling you, would they even mutilate themselves? It's the heart that's got to be circumcised. And the way it gets circumcised is by looking away from yourself and looking only to the cross of Jesus Christ. That's where it happens. And so the helps to joy, those are the hindrances. And I just want to close out, and I'm just going to introduce the helps to joy because the rest of this passage is going to unfold it. So I'm going to give you the helps, and we'll go to the table, and then next week we're going to start unpacking this. (coughs) So Paul says in verse 3, For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So if we get our hearts circumcised, what's that going to look like? It's going to look like verse 3. You're going to worship in the Holy Spirit and He's now going to come inside and He's going to change your heart to love God. So before He does that, we're at enmity with God. And we we don't want to submit to him and we want to tell him how to run our lives. And he comes and he changes them and now we love him. We love his word. We love his will. And he's going to change your heart. And now Christ's saying, "I, I want worshipers. The Father's looking for those who will worship me on the inside. 
in spirit and in truth. He's not looking for the externals of worship. The church has got this new flooding back to the externals of worship, like it's going to make it more holy. And the new covenant is, I want worship that comes from the Holy Spirit who's dwelling within you, revealing the gospel and the beauties of Christ. And I want you to come worship now from a new heart, from the inside. And then the works will come out. So this is, this is it. Circumcision is of the heart. And secondly, now you glory in Christ. And this, this is just the gospel. If you have a new heart, I no longer glory in my resume and what I have done and what I have accomplished. All my moral things that I, 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 I hate when I hear the reason I know I'm a Christian is I, I've been a, a, a deacon for 25 years and I've done that isn't it. You got to quit glorying in anything but Jesus Christ. This is how you know if you've been saved. As you sit here this morning, if I said, are you a Christian? And you say, I'm trying. That's, that's false. Look at this. Am you a Christian? I glory in Christ alone. Who he is, what he has done, his death on the cross and his righteousness. I have no other boast. I boast in Christ alone. There's nothing else. You ask me if I'm a Christian? Yeah, because I glory in Christ. He's my hope. He's my boast. He's the beauty. He's the glory that I've come to see. And so don't lean on anything else, but just looking away from yourself and staring your eyes out at the beauty and glory of Christ. Glory in him this morning. See his sufficiency. See what he, when he says, te telos die, glory, it's finished Don't let some false teacher tell you you got to add something to that. Glory in the finished work of Christ. Amen. And it just ties together. Then put no confidence in your flesh. The longer I live, I just keep learning my flesh. Just nothing. In me dwells no good thing. And every sin I've ever tried to go fight in my own flesh, I get knocked on my keister. I've never put to death one sin in my flesh. I've never gotten myself one step closer to God by everything that I tried. I went off to seminary thinking that that could get me closer to God. That's a lie. There's no confidence in the flesh. And next week, I can't wait to hold up your resumes because I'm going to show you that this is our whole way of life in America. And you got to look at it and say, that's manure. That's manure to me. I have no confidence in anything that I do. Are you saved? Yeah, I got baptized at Southside Bible Church. That's manure. And I I just, I'm begging you to put no confidence in anything that you've ever done or anything that you've accomplished or what you're fighting, that you vote Republican or you carry a gun. I, I don't know, I'm just going off. Whatever it is, no confidence in the flesh. Come glory. Christ alone, and I'm telling you, this is the recipe for joy. And this righteousness cannot change because Jesus does not change. Yours is going to do this till the cows come home. And if it's in this, you'll never have joy, except on some days when you had a good day. And on the bad days, you'll despair. You'll just be that the rest of your life. And I'm asking you to come out of that. Put no confidence in your flesh and glory in Christ and the joy will fill you and flood you to know that I am loved by God infinitely because of the work of Jesus Christ. Isn't that better than go clean yourself up and do this and do that, that you fail at every day? Look your eyes out at Jesus Christ this morning. Lay your deadly doing down. Down at Jesus' feet, stand in Him and Him alone, gloriously complete. So as I close out, I've been reading, going back to this book I read a while ago called The Gospel-Centered Life. And in this book, he talks about shrinking the cross. And what he is going at, if you look at, I was going to put it up on a chart, but I'm not that talented. Um, It's just picture a graph that this is going higher and this is going lower. And the Christian life is you start growing in your awareness of God's holiness. When I got saved, I knew God was holy, and now I know God is holy. So it just keeps going up. As you learn the Word of God and walk with Him, 
you just, he's so holy. And then I'm starting to learn the awareness of my sin and my flesh and how deep pride runs and how deep selfishness is in the heart. So it just keeps going like this. So now you're at a dilemma. What do I do with that? Do I put my fingers in my ears and say, ooh, I can't hear you, I'm a Christian, doesn't matter, and, and it doesn't work doing that. And, and so the, he talks about two things that you do. You fake it. You become a pretender and you walk in here and smile, you got all your stuff together, and you're falling apart. And you know what that does? That shrinks the cross. It just makes it smaller and smaller by your pretending. <clears throat> the other way that you can try to shrink it is my righteousness isn't so bad. My, my righteousness, I, I'm really growing. I got some things that are making me more acceptable to God. And as you do that, you're, you're, you're ruining the cross. So as these two grow, the gospel is the cross gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. I glory in Christ alone because the chasm is getting greater and greater and greater. I thought I was going to get saved and they were going to go like this. <laughs> And that hasn't been the case. And that's why Paul said, I'm the greatest of sinners. That's why he said, the good I want to do, I don't. And the things I hate, I keep doing. So I want you to catch this last part of the temptation to shrink the cross through your performance. And he's, he wrote down 10 things. And I went over this with the young marrieds a couple years ago. I'm going to shoot them like bullets. It's my favorite thing to do. So just listen if you're doing this. Job righteousness. I'm just a hard worker. And I look down on everyone who's not a hard worker like me. Uh, God's going to reward me because I'm such a hard worker. Theological righteousness. I got good theology and all of those little Arminians, God just smiles at me because I got it. Intellectual righteousness. I'm better than, than others because I'm just superior because I understand so much of theology. Uh, schedule righteousness. I'm so self-disciplined and rigorous with my time management and all these poor other people that just can't get their schedules right. They're like Pastor Ken and they just flop all over the place. And I just feel really special because I can control my schedule. I'm better. Flexibility righteousness. I'm just so flexible. I can just move. You guys are so rigid with your schedules, man. I'm better because I'm just flexible. And I can make time for other people where you can't. Lie. <laughs> Mercy righteousness. I care about the poor and nobody else really does. Like, I wish you guys could wake up and realize how much you need to come care about the poor like me. Legalistic righteousness. I don't smoke, drink, or chew. Financial righteousness. I manage money wisely and I've stayed out of debt my whole life and these other poor people can't do it. And you're just so proud of your little, what's his name, Larry something? Burkett. No, I don't remember. The, what's the guy's name that's so f popular? Ramsey. Yeah, I do Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> Political righteousness. I've already hit that. I'm a gun carrying republic. Tolerance righteousness. <laughs> I'm open minded and I'm just charitable to other people like Jesus was. I accept everybody. Um, you guys are so narrow and judgmental and critical. And I just, this list could go on and on. And what it does you start feeling like, man, I, my righteousness is really earning me something. So you're shrinking the cross because you're sitting here really thinking that your righteousness is, is making you more acceptable to God. And so here's the question as we close. What does Jesus think of you right now as you come to the table? I was at a church where there was so much scrutinizing over your sin that about five people out of 500 would come to the communion table and so what I want, I want everyone who's a believer to come to the communion table this morning. So I want you to really answer that. This is an important question. As you sit here this morning, what does Jesus think about you right now? And if it's, well, I got to clean up a little bit tomorrow. And uh, I, I don't think, I, I don't feel like he accepts me. And just, I want you to wrestle is the gospel right now that you sit in him gloriously complete that you sit here loved by God the same way he loved his son. This is my son and who I am well pleased when he was baptized. And God looks at you because you're wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. This is my son or daughter and who I am well pleased. 
And are you looking at all your righteousness right now? And I can't have, I can't be. And I want you to find joy this morning in glory in Christ, in Christ alone. That is the gospel. Look your eyes out this morning at Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray now as we come to the table, I pray that we wouldn't shrink the cross by being pretenders. I pray that we would be honest and real and transparent with you and others. I pray that we wouldn't shrink the cross by thinking we got some kind of righteousness that's better than others. God, our flesh, in, in it dwells no good thing. We have no confidence in the flesh. But God, the more we grow in this Christian life, the more we glory in Christ Jesus. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to you, God, through him. Please let that land deeply by faith in every soul here this morning. If there are any who have mixed a whole life of religion with Jesus, like the Judaizers, God set them free. Let them look at Jesus now and believe for the first time with none of their own stuff, nothing to add to believe only in Jesus Christ. God, would you grant them that gift even this morning? And I pray as we come to the table now that we would rejoice in Jesus Christ who was broken on our behalf and his blood was spilled out for the forgiveness of our sins. God, let us look our eyes out together now as the people of God. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.